all the participants to come back to the room, take your seats so we can start. We're about to start the session, so those who can uh, and others can sneak in later, I guess. Uh, we are also waiting for Belen Martinez. Ah, I think they are there. Welcome back, everyone. Let's start this session. We will now get to discuss uh, the, some of the report's findings together with democracy strongholds from key EU institutions and civil society, as you see on the panel. This panel will flesh out the four key recommendations of the report and break their heads as well around some overarching questions uh, at stake for global democracy. It will be a hybrid panel and it will be in the good hands of uh, moderator Sam van der Staak, who is director of the Europe program uh, at International IDEA and in lead of International IDEA's representation to the EU. Sam has been the initiative taker uh, and the driving force behind what we call the Swedish Presidency Project in all its stages, and including the dialogues and consultations which led to the recommendations that are presented today. So thank you, Sam, for taking up the baton and uh, start your session. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for being here in such great numbers. Uh, my name is Sam van der Staak, as Marilyn already mentioned, and in this session, this first panel session, we'll be discussing the report findings, the findings that were presented just before the coffee break, the four main ones uh, that were highlighted, uh, and we're going to talk about the new challenges and priorities for EU's external democracy action. So what does this report imply for those new challenges that we see? in this rapidly shifting world, and I think all the speakers of the opening panel mentioned it this morning, we live in turbulent times. The Zeitenwende, as the German Chancellor called it, this rapid change of affairs that really has woken us up into a, a new world where democracy seems to be one of the fault lines, right? And what does that mean for EU action? That's what we're going to discuss. And we have uh, a few excellent panelists. We have Thomas Tobé, member of the European Parliament and chair of the DEVI Committee. We have Belen Martinez Carbonel, Managing Director for Global Affairs of the European External Action Service. We have Mathieu Bousquet, Acting Director uh, of the Director General for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations, so the part of the commission that deals with the immediate neighborhood of the, the EU. We have uh, Misha Ramakas, Deputy Head of Unit of DG INPA of the European Commission, dealing with the, the rest of the world. And then last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Janjira Sombat Punsiri online. Yes, we have her behind me here. Uh, of the Institute of Asian Studies of Chula Longkorn University and the German Institute for Global 
uh, and area studies. And uh, Janjira is one of the civil society experts that we've consulted during the process of you know, trying to bring this report together. So a warm welcome to all these speakers who really represent all sides of the EU and of civil society that together have provided the input for this report. And I think that collective approach reflects what, again, all the speakers this morning said of, we have to do this together. If we want to really revitalize democracy, we have to do it in a collective approach. So no better way to discuss the report itself by, than by looking at all the different elements of the EU and what everybody has to offer. Now, we will listen to all speakers for around five minutes with some brief opening statements, uh, and then we'll have a moderated discussion. Uh, and in their interventions, we've asked all the speakers to focus on three questions. First, in this uh, new world where we see competing models clashing, uh, how will the EU try to promote democracy? What's, how does it see its role? Two, uh, the outcomes of the report, the recommendations of the report, do they resonate to face the challenges in this rapidly changing world? And three, uh, how do we foster within the EU the political will to make these changes, given that there's so many other priorities that the EU is trying to, to confront? Uh, trade-related, security-related, migration-related, you name it. Uh, and we have to balance all of that with democracy. So those three questions uh, we'll zoom into a little bit more. So let's get started with the first panelist, Thomas Tobey, already mentioned, member of the European Parliament, chair of the DEVIC committee. Um, in his first mandate, but before that, Thomas was a member of the Riksdag, the Swedish parliament, for many, many years, 13 years, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and in that position, he held many important offices, including chair of the Committee on Justice, Committee on Education, and the Committee on the Labour Market. So a long political career, and of course, not just a member of the European Parliament, but also a representative of Sweden, uh, which is extra important given the Swedish presidency. So without any further ado, Thomas, the floor is yours. Mm. Uh, thank you, and I'm uh, delighted uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, and that is, of course, because uh, for me, democracy is uh, really, of course, close to my heart and, of course, to all of us uh, in this room. And I think it is, I mean, what I, I mean, it, it has been stated many times. I mean, of course, now we see a declining trend uh, for democracy and, and governance uh, from a global perspective. And I think it is important to really understand what this is because this is, at least speaking as a politician, this is a political fight. And it is a political fight that we cannot afford to lose. Because if we lose this, it best, of course it is in our own interest. I mean, we are in a way representing democratic states, but it will affect us. It will affect, of course, people in many countries that will have the lack of democracy and rule of law in their life. But of course, it will also hurt us. So I think this is something that we need now to understand that we, we cannot uh, just have uh, nice seminars and nice words about this. We really have to start, start acting now. Of course, I welcome that uh, the Swedish presidency now have, the, have this as a, cre uh, a key priority. Uh, of course, it is uh, it's good that we can work with the midterm review of the EU action plan on human rights and democracy. Of course, that we should focus on uh, combating uh, corruption. Generally speaking, I must also say, and, I, and, and a big thank you to uh, IDEA for also in, inviting me and also uh, uh, making this report. Uh, generally, I think that this, uh, this report is a really good one. Uh, I have read many reports uh, during my life, uh, and I think actually this report actually pushes things a bit further down the road, and, and hopefully this discussion uh, can, be, can bring some new ideas as well. Uh, I think it's quite useful for me, I would say, in, uh, of course, my role as uh, chairman of the DEVE committee. Uh, I'm also co-chairing uh, the Democracy Support and Election Coordination Group, uh, DEG. Uh, some of you might know what it is, but I also think that is important for, for the European uh, Parliament. If I ought to do some personal uh, reflect, reflections then, uh, I think it, uh, the first point that I would like uh, to make is, yes, I think that EU, uh, we are slowly, 
slowly realizing uh, that we must uh, improve uh, our external uh, democracy uh, action, and that is of course good. Uh, one example is of course uh, what the Commission has launched with the Global uh, Gateway uh, Strategy. That is of course clearly an, I would say, an, an, an attempt uh, to uh, offer uh, what we will call a, a value-based uh, option uh, for our uh, partner uh, countries. And I think that, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can say about Global Gateway. And of course, as European Parliament, uh, uh, we want, uh, of course, to see that we actually will also deliver uh, to all the, uh, all the obligations that have already been, been made. But with that said, and politically, uh, and, and to this discussion, I think this is the right way to go. Uh, I think that we, we have to do this because, of course, uh, we do see that we have competing uh, models that offer something uh, to our partner countries. And, of course, we need to understand that we have to show our partner countries why democracy is a better model for governance, which actually also can achieve results. And in that sense, I will also say that I think Global Gateway can be helpful, and it is something uh, that we need to work on more. Secondly, I think it is clear, finally, that EU development policy has become part now of the, how should I put it, wider political landscape. Uh, I remember when we were uh, um, negotiating the different positions uh, in the European Parliament, and I was newly elected, and I looked at the different uh, committees, and of course I looked at the DEVA committee, and it's a quite small uh, committee in the European Parliament. But for me, and during this mandate, it's been very clear that even if it is a very small committee, everybody understands now it is an important committee. Mm -hmm because many of the challenges that politicians uh, need to rise up to, it also comes back now to uh, development uh, cooperation. And I think that is quite interesting to see. We have a, a lot of attention these days uh, from others that perhaps didn't pay that much attention to, to the work that we do in the, in the DEVE uh, committee. And I, I think this is, is something that we should get used to. Of course, we need to find different ways to organize ourselves uh, in the future, perhaps to even better have a more holistic uh, approach uh, when it comes to, of course, obtaining some of our foreign policy, uh, EU goals that we have, but of course also when it comes to development that we want to see in our partner countries. Uh, because it basically means that we need to understand better how to use the full range of the toolbox uh, that we have uh, in hand. One example, and that is also one of the uh, recommendations uh, from the report, is how we can use, of course, better trade policy uh, negotiations. And uh, to be clear, that means that we cannot, we cannot continue to shy away from using systematically political conditionality when democratic principles it is at stance. I think that is one of the, the key conclusions. And of course that is very easy uh, to say, but I also think that we need now to actually start doing that. Uh, I think that there is no other way for us to go. The Council's uh, negotiating mandate on the revised GSP uh, regulation, I think, is positive in these uh, regards. Uh, I mean, that basically means extends negative conditionality uh, to try to uh, prevent, but I think that is also something that we can keep uh, doing. We have from the DEVA committee, we have uh, recently attributed an opinion to, to AFET on the functioning of EIS where we do reiterate that we think that assistance uh, should be suspended uh, if we have the event of degradation uh, in democracy, for, for example. Um, thirdly, uh, I would like uh, to state that I do think it is uh, important that we try to maintain a political will for making democracy central in EU external uh, policy. And, and here I come to the point of also the external uh, democracy um, uh, support. 
Because I think if you don't have the foundation of democracy and rule of law and human rights, it's very hard for my colleagues also in INTA or in ENVI or in LIBE to be successful. And I think that also needs to be understood, that this is the basis where we have to work. I mean, we have some lessons to learn also with our work within our union. We should not focus on that today. But it, it is clear that if we don't have the foundations protected, then of course we will run into other uh, problems uh, as well. And of course it is in EU's interest to ensure that our partner countries uh, embrace democratic uh, governance. Uh, and I don't think once again that we can lose sight uh, of this uh, in Brussels. So I am very pleased uh, to see that this is a priority, of course, from the Swedish uh, presidency. I think that these recommendations are uh, very helpful. Um, if I are to, to sum up, because perhaps my, my time is running out, uh, I would sum it up then to, firstly, we need now to find a way to show our partner countries the real benefits of democratic governance. That is the first one that we need to do. Secondly, we need to, of course, figure out how to respond to third countries that are moving in the wrong direction. We can have, take some lessons that we perhaps saw in the, the UN uh, vote on this uh, awful uh, war that we are experiencing, where we could see some of our partners, uh, countries, for, ex for example, abstaining in the UN vote. Uh, of course, on the, on the one hand, we cannot just let that go, I would say. I think it is important that it means that we will have a reaction. But of course, we have to find a way and a pragmatic way on how we should actually uh, work with that, because in the end, we're interested in, in the end uh, result. And lastly, of course, we need to position ourselves better than countries like China uh, and Russia, because it is a competitive uh, landscape. Um, my experience when I have um, traveled uh, to partner countries, and I will not I will not name them, but, but let me just say that one of the lessons when I have sat down with political uh, leaders, I would say for most of our African friends, they do want to work with the European Union. Mm -hmm. They see Europe as the neighbor. Uh, and of course, sometimes they feel that uh, Europe is uh, too much demanding. That's true. We are demanding, and I think we should be demanding. But of course, they want to find a way uh, also uh, to not have uh, the only option sometimes to choose China or to choose Russia. And I think that uh, we have all the opportunities ahead of us, of course, a lot of challenges. But I think uh, we are on the right track now. We are slowly waking up, trying to understand this now. And now it's time to draw some political lessons. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Now, now, Thomas, a quick follow-up question before we move on, uh, because I think you, you basically highlighted two of the recommendations. One is the narrative. You ended with that. Uh, can we show that democracy delivers? Can we show our African partners that there's something really to be gained? And two is your point on uh, infusing democracy in other policies, such as the Global Gateway, and introducing a, a form of conditionality. Now, that, that second point, we've been mulling this over when we wrote the report, and sometimes we got the question, yeah, but then how do you deal with some of the hard issues of you know, getting a, a, an energy deal through in a time when energy is scarce? Or how do you deal with migration crises if you have to you know, act quickly and you happen to have uh, a, a non-democratic leader that you need to deal with? Uh, what would be your answer to that? How do you, you know, make sure that democracy stands as strong vis-a-vis uh, -vis all those other priorities? Well, there is, of course, no, no, easy, no easy answer to that. Uh, but I, I think it, it is, um, for our partner countries, it is not strange uh, if uh, Europe goes, uh, take further steps down uh, to work with more conditionality. Uh, and that we are more frank uh, with what we also expect from our partner countries, if. 
uh, if we also at the same time truly are interested in listening to their demands and really try to understand uh, where they are, uh, politically speaking. Because, of course, there is difference also between uh, the countries. Uh, and, and that means, and I'm not saying this only because I'm a Swede, but I, I, I do be believe in the pragmatic approach. You can have very strong principles, but of course you can also find pragmatic solutions. But of course, uh, there will come more cases, I would say, in the future, where we will perhaps have to choose even harder. And then I'm more leaning to the, to the way that we have to stand up for these values, because there is no one else who will. Um, of course, when it comes to the narrative uh, and showing, um, of course, that our model uh, can be more effective, I think it sometimes, of course, for us, it's very easy to start, of course, where, where our heart is and about the principles. And of course, we shouldn't shy away from that. But perhaps sometimes also it is very um, clear to, to explain that if you want to have long-term investments from the private sector, and if you want them to really trust that they can be in your country for a long time, well, then this is a better model for you. I think sometimes you, you have to be as simple as that uh, in trying to uh, promote our model better. Yeah. Excellent. Be principled, but also pragmatic. I think that's, uh, that's the guiding line. Thank a you very, very political answer, I must say. Yeah. No, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. But no, yeah. Let's continue to the next speaker. Belen Martinez Carbonell, I mentioned already, is the Managing Director for Global Affairs at the European External Action Service. Uh, has been there for quite a long time, uh, but before joining the election, the election uh, external action service, I mean, uh, she worked in uh, the cabinet of different commissions, Commissioner for External Relations and the Commissioner for Trade. So has a wide background in EU matters. And Belen, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, do I need, okay, thanks. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, no. Uh, no good, ah, uh, voila. Thanks a lot. It's good to have an MEP to show you how to work the mics. <laughs> no, uh, thanks a lot to, to IDEA, thanks a lot to the Swedish government and to other speakers that will be with me this morning for organizing this event. Um, thank mostly for the report. I think it's very good that we are being told by more independent and neutral readers what we are doing better, what we are doing worse because we are not always good at self-criticism, so it's good that some people help us look ourselves in the mirror. Um, I'm not going to talk too long, because a lot of what I would be saying this morning will be very much on the same line what Eamon Gilmour has said already, for one reason, which is that we work very much closely together, and we obviously share the priorities and the principles. Uh, these being said, the succession of unprecedented crises in the last years have reminded us all of the value of the democracy, how much we cherish it, and how much it has been backsliding in the light of internal and external threats. A lot of us would immediately be thinking of Ukraine, but there are other countries that come to my mind, Iran being one, for example, which is really going from bad to worse. And you know, what could I say about Afghanistan and, and others when we're talking about conditionalities and you think of the poor women and girls. But um, so the, the Swedish presidency comes at the right moment to provide an, an important momentum for the work on protecting and strengthening democracy globally. Uh, the way Sweden supported um, this policy already in 2019 and, and reached uh, the agreement on the text of the Council conclusions on, on democracy he has not been forgotten by, by some of us. And, and they played an important role on, on half the democracy priorities reflected on the action plan for human rights. Uh, the EU, as you know, has a comprehensive approach to democracy and encompasses the promotion and protection of human rights, rule of law, and the empowerment of people that we try to um, translate into action, but very actively promoting and protesting 
when there are, there are, there are violations of freedom of association, expression, media, but also very factually and actively protecting human rights defenders, gender equality, and the empowerment of women and, and youth. We have a comprehension toolbox, as you know, because it's widely referred to in, in the report, and there are some good ideas there that uh, we use to implement this comprehensive approach. And the, and the action plan on human rights and democracy is one very best example of how we tried to do this, and probably one of the, the most important element in our toolbox, although not the only one. So it's very timely that we discuss today the report of IDEA, which, as I said, provides some nice recommendations, interesting recommendations. Um, we continue to witness the deepening grip of authoritarian regimes in their society, and we believe that it's a time when democracies have to demonstrate their resilience and defend themselves against the narrative. It is a word that is becoming very much on everybody's, it's coming very much on everybody's mind. It's not just about what you do, but what people see that you do, and how people explain what you do, and therefore the narratives. And, and, and besides talking about it, we have to be determined in our actions to, to, sh to show and demonstrate that democracy is, as others have said this morning, the system that best delivers. And you know, a very much used example is the case of China and COVID. And I think that you know, when two options were put on the table about which system will deliver first, many at the very beginning of the outbreak uh, were turning their, their heads to, to some authoritarian regimes that were, were promoting the successful of their strategies. But at the end of the day, they may be a bit slower, but more democratic. Uh, policies that were put forward in the European Union with more distributed and socially fair systems have provided, have become much more successful in finding the right balance. And so to me, that's, if anyone has a doubt, that's an, an example of democracy showing results with numbers and numbers of people alive and people, unfortunately, deceased. Uh, the EU obviously has an unambiguous commitment to defend international rules-based order, upholding international law, including human rights and international humanitarian law. Uh, working together should always be our automatic response, and, and democracy is first and foremost about pursuing together as European Union the defense and protection of, of democracy. The Russian war of aggression, and a lot has been said this morning, uh, unfortunately, about this horrible uh, war, has underlined yet again how interconnected we are. And, uh, and, and maybe if, if, uh, if I may react to the, to the reference earlier today about what to do with those countries that have not supported us at the, in the votes, the famous votes of list of votes in the General Assembly. Uh, the way we've been trying to, to respond to that is not as a list of who are your friends, who are your enemies, who you blacklist for the rest of their lives, but rather as a signal of the countries where we are failing in promoting democracy and making them understand the importance of, for us and the gravity of this Russian aggression. So the way we have been trying to, to read those lists and those votes is give us a signal of the areas where we should possibly engage more, which is why we've, we've reacted in such a uh, reaching out way to the first negative votes of India, for example. We, we understood clearly that India was in a difficult position and a democratic system, which is under a lot of, of, of threat as well, and we have since reached out and tried to cooperate closer with a country like India. But we also aware that we need to address our own internal challenges. Uh, we were discussing the reference this morning to the humility. We, we need to be also telling the world that we understand we are not perfect. 
And it is uh, for this reason that the President von der Leyen has announced in the State of the Union her intention to put forward this Defence of Democracy package. And that is one of the priorities that will guide us um, this, this, this year. In the recent years, we have also been developing innovative initiatives to address many of the challenges that democracy is facing today. There are new challenges to democracy, uh, such as those that many speakers have referred of the promoting democracy in a digital day, in a digital world. And, and, and mainstreaming digital issues across all policies, human rights, democracy, uh, even you know um, ownership of companies. <laughs> it's it's uh, all, it's part of these new technologies that we need to learn to live with and to make sure that they support democracy and they don't open new avenues for vulnerabilities. We have many internal initiatives to build on, and I think Europe can again be setting standards, like the Digital Service Act, the Code of Conduct on Hate Speech, or the work on countering for interference and disinformation. And again, these are good examples of what uh, Europe could do, could do better. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's not just in Europe, but in also countries that we thought to be consolidated democracies uh, that have been uh, suffering the consequence of the manipulation of digital media. An example that comes to our minds is the attacks on the US capitals or the attacks to to the government institutions in Brazil. It's not by coincidence that this um, hatred was organized towards the Congress, towards the Parliament, because they represent probably what democracy stands for and is what this, those forces are precisely fighting against. So we will continue to work in, in these areas. We'll continue to support independent media, human rights defenders, among which Domestic election observers are very close to our heart and the priorities of what we do. But collectively, to achieve results, it's uh, very crucial that we team up, that we team up as Europe, but also that we team up with civil society. And this morning, there were references to inclusivity, something that we totally, totally approach. Finally, in the context of increasing pressures on fundamental rights, uh, civic and political <coughs> rights, uh, the EU will continue to promote inclusive and representative decision making and a deliber deliberative and participative model of governments. Uh, and related to this, uh, we welcome a key recommendation of the report, which is to continue placing a strong focus on women and youth participation in civic and political processes. The worst that can happen to our societies is that young people disengage from democratic processes. And, and a concrete example of the work that is being done within this framework of the Summit for Democracy is the cohort on youth political and civic engagement led by the Commission to whom Commissioner Upalaina referred this morning together with Nepal and, and Ghana. This cohort is a motivated example of the work we can do together as Europe and together with countries around the world, with Nepal and Ghana in this, in this regard. And therefore, I put it out as a good example to be followed in the future. I'll stop here. Happy to take questions. And thanks again to, to ID and to Sweden for organizing this. Belen, a quick follow-up question, because you did indeed mention there's a whole lot of things that go into that democracy package, right? you know, human rights and rule of law and anti-corruption and uh, elections. <clears throat> what for you stands out as one priority that you would say the EU has to do a little bit better, where it's also most credible? And you, know, you refer to digital, for instance. Is there one thing where you think we need to really uh, put a bit extra effort? There are a lot of things we need to put an extra effort. But um, I think part of what we need to put an extra effort is both on digital and climate. We're putting out models that we think are good for the world, but we need to explain the world why these models are good for them, listen to their feedback, and then help them to integrate it into their policies and to address the consequences that this uh, may have. 
Um, that's it. <laughs> question, digital and climate. That's what I heard you say, so we'll keep that in mind. Thank you very much, Belen. We'll now move to the third speaker, Mathieu Bousquet. Mathieu, uh, acting director of DG Nair, dealing with the neighborhood of the EU. And of course, that's where democracy has come in stark focus over the past year with the war in Ukraine. Uh, Mathieu, uh, the, the uh, department that he leads focuses on thematic support, coordination of policy and financial instruments. Uh, so that includes democracy, human rights, and all the thematic issues that the EU finds important in its immediate neighborhood. So I'll hand over to you for your intervention, Mathieu. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you first, I mean, to uh, IDEA and to uh, um, the Swedish uh, presidency. I mean, IDEA for the report, very good report indeed. And I focus my interventions on some of the recommendations that you made on how we can uh, uh, try to implement them. And of course, thank you to the, to the Swedish presidency for the focus on uh, this issue. I think we all talked about it, but it is um, unprecedented times and challenges that we are facing, I mean, with the unprovoked Russian aggression against Ukraine, um, which we are dealing with, I mean, in, in my DG on a daily basis, of course, but also with the worldwide consequences, as Belen said. So, so the report presents a very, I would say, timely recommendations, and I'm going to try to, to focus a little bit on them. So to start with, uh, one of your first recommendations is to develop a new narrative on democracy to be presented as a, a universal aspiration. Uh, I fully subscribe to that. I think it's important that we develop a new narrative which can help overcome the idea that democracy is only a Western product, that we try to export, or as some opponents would say, and we hear that when we go in the neighboring countries, that we're trying to impose. So we need to promote the flourishing of democratic culture within the societies at the right pace. Of course, prudence is of the essence, but we need to demonstrate more robustly the value of democracy so that attitudes reflect this. And Beden gave a very good example. Democracy can deliver for its citizens. And when you go in the neighborhood or in the enlargement and you discuss with population, they very much see also joining the EU as joining this, I mean, joining a democracy that takes care of their citizens and that can bring results for them. Also, clearly, I mean, the global resurgence of uh, authoritarianism, attacks on fundamental rights, distortions brought about by corruption, alternative narratives, and disinformation remind us daily that even our own democracy cannot be taken for granted, not to mention international peace and order. And President von der Leyen, um, in his last, last State of the Union address, said we must protect democracies from the external threats they face and from the vices that corrode them from within. So in such challenging times, striving to promote freedoms and democratic processes, foster fundamental rights and the rule of law, fully agree with Belen that is exactly associated, as well as sustaining civil society is more urgent than ever. So the EU holds its commitment to be a beacon for the global advancement of democracy, but also for the rule of law and fundamental rights. Now coming to another recommendation to touch on the narrative to the need to preserve democracy at the pillar of EU's external relation. Let me use a little bit what we are doing in the enlargement process. So we had a decision to open accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia to grant a candidate status to Ukraine, to Moldova, to Bosnia and Herzegovina, to offer a European perspective to Georgia, also to set a target for visa liberalization for Kosovo. This has been all very decisive steps to uh, bring neighbors closer. And these steps also empower the EU to promote crucial reforms for the benefits of citizens. In this context, democracy in all its dimensions is finding reinvigorated prominence. The revised enlargement methodology uh, from 2020 puts what we call the fundamental cluster which is rule of law, economic criteria, and public administration reform at the heart of the accession process. And the functioning of democratic institutions 
is a key part of these fundamentals, and it has for the first time been incorporated into the negotiation, making it a more visible part of our structure engagement with partner countries. So a clear example is about how to embed our democracy and our democratic principles into our external policy, internal policy. The functioning of democratic institutions. When we turn to Ukraine, the democratic path of Ukraine has been a decades-long fight, not only to secure its independence, but also to realize its aspiration to embrace the EU systems of values and institutions. Russia's war of aggression aims to undermine Ukraine's effort. But it just underlines even more the importance of us working relentlessly to assist Ukraine on its path towards being a fully sovereign, democratic, European country committed to European value and future EU membership. So it's also very encouraging that Ukraine is showing unprecedented, unprecedented progress in the alignment of its legislation with the EU acquis and the reform of institutions, particularly in the areas of anti-corruption and justice, but also anti-money laundering and media freedom. So there is a lot of ground to cover, and in some partners, there is structural resistance to initiative openly aimed at uh, democracy building. And this is where we can use our toolbox, and maybe use even more our toolbox, as it is mentioned in the report, as we've done in, in, in Diginia. So we're trying to support rule of law and good governance programs that strengthen transparency and accountability of public institutions, that do stabilize the justice systems and promote the prevention and fight against corruption. Where the space to support democratization is more limited, it is still important to pursue actions around it with equal determination and ambition. For example, in uh, 2023, we are relaunching our structured dialogue with civil society in the southern neighborhood under uh, the civil society facility. The goal is to understand better the backsliding of democracy in certain contexts and then adapt policies and programs taking into account civil society recommendations. Due to shrinking space for the civil society, we do not only use our human rights and civil society thematic programs, but also we do work with organizations such as the European Endowment for Democracy that are able to support the unsupported uh, and work with activists that are also on the front line of democracy promotion. The other entry point is also provided by the uh, work on inclusiveness, on which we embark both across enlargement countries and broader neighborhood. And here we have many programs and projects aimed at fostering greater participation of women, youth, people with disabilities, and marginalized groups. This, of course, includes our work on gender equality. This brings me to another of your flagship messages, which I once more very much appreciate, working on youth, pushing for equality, easing integration of vulnerable groups, are crucial investment that will hopefully bring societies closer to democratic stability through support on the ground. And it was very refreshing, I mean, when we organized the EU for Youth event uh, earlier in uh, 2022, I mean, to get all the feedback from uh, uh, young people from all over the region saying, I mean, what they are working on in their country and the support they're asking uh, for us. Finally, your report called for a more integrated approach in the promotion of democracy, a holistic approach, as uh, our chair of the DV committee uh, just mentioned. This is another point. Um, so establishing an integrated approach should also be matched with increased attention paid to democracy promotion as been envisaged under the European Democracy Action Plan. The way we nurture and bolster our democracy foundations in the Union and Member States has an impact on the strength of our external action. I'm quoting the report, the plan. So we also note and we are very pleased to know that the EU is perceived as a key player for global democracy promotion. At the same time, uh, we take note that the consultations indicated that the EU is losing popularity, for instance, in the Western Balkans or uh, constituencies across the Middle East and North Africa somehow lost faith in our ability to have more decisive impact than other geopolitical actors. So certainly, I mean, the findings are very useful, are going to help us trigger reflection on not only how to do better, but also how to communicate it better. As, as Belen just said, our outreach will be crucial. So to succeed, we need to be more robust, to be more proactive, and pursue meaningful actions 
to counter threats to democracy, human rights, and international peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Also for pointing out that democracy has already received a re reinvigorated prominence, as you called it, within the work of DG Nair in the whole accession process. So I think that's already a big step forward that we are seeing within the EU. My question to you is, when we did these consultations with civil society in, in the Eastern Partnership region, a lot of points we, we heard were, you, you have to work with us, but do so as equals. And the examples we were given was, you know, Ukrainian tech developers. They said, we ha are doing stuff that is uh, much more advanced than what we're seeing in some EU member states. Uh, much more experience with things like cybersecurity or disinformation because they're a frontline state. Uh, how, how would you respond to this request for greater partnership of equals? How, how does DG Nier deal with that development? I mean, absolutely. I mean, this is a, a, an equal partnership that we are trying to set up. Um, but I mean, this is also where we need to communicate about that and to work also with, uh, with civil society and people. Um, I mean, as you just said, there are many examples of very good ways, for example, of working against corruption, I mean, of involving civil society, on getting in the public administration reform, getting uh, the administration closer to the citizen than in the EU. Well, I'm not sure in the EU we are always prepared to recognize that there are better examples elsewhere. So this is also something where we have to listen, we have to look and uh, discuss with partner countries what they are doing that can be also of inspiration for us. I mean, of course, the Ukrainian digital uh, very, are very skillful in terms of uh, 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 digital uh, development. But it's not only that. I mean, it's also about the way to nurture the democracy that we can find inspiration there <laughs> and not preach what we are doing and sometimes are not doing. So really finding a, a balanced partnership with them, recognizing the good, uh, the good experience that is taking place there. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, let us move on to the next speaker, Misha Ramakers, the deputy head of unit of uh, DG INPA uh, of the European Commission. And uh, Misha works at the unit. He's the deputy head of the unit that deals with gender equality, human rights, and democratic governance. So spot on on all the topics that we are discussing here today. Misha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks also uh, to IDEA for organizing this event and for the other speakers who have already covered a lot of ground. Um, is, ah, it's the other one, okay. Hope you hear me better now. I'm not going to start again. Um, so I'm going to um, try and keep it short, but also um, set out a couple of issues and then engage a little bit with the recommendations that were made in the report. I, I looked through the recommendations. I think they're very interesting, very thought-provoking. Also, the, the sort of the, the lower level nitty gritty ones where there's a lot of, you know, uh, titillating stuff that, that really helps, I think, to, for us to, to focus on where do we go next. But before, before doing that, I would like to take you back, actually, uh, three decades, just to recall that supporting democracy is not, and, and the EU supporting democracy is not something new. We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, when I was a spring chicken uh, and entering into EU land 30 years ago, um, we were involved in setting up the European Initiative for, for Democracy and Human Rights. Uh, we were, in the, a couple of years later, we set up uh, the organization I worked for, then set up the FAR Democracy Program and the TASIS Democracy Program. Some of you may remember those. They were programs to promote democracy, civil society, inclusiveness in Central Europe on the one hand with FAR and in the former Soviet Union uh, with the TASIS democracy program. Uh, we can have a long discussion about, you know, is that successful 30 years uh, uh, with retrospect or not? I would say in part yes, in part no. It's, it's a, you know, a mixed uh, score sheet undoubtedly. But I think it shows that, you know, support to democracy, to human rights, to the rule of law are at the core of external relations, EU external relations. Uh, they're enshrined in the treaty and we've been acting on them for a long time. They're also intertwined. You can't do without one without uh, the other. I think the other bit of good news that we need to keep in mind is that the EU and the member states are actually together the main donors worldwide 
for democracy support. We provide more than half of the financial support uh, in that area. That's not a reason to be self-satisfied, but it's a reality. So uh, these, these are issues we can, we can build on, uh, I would say. Maybe right now we have some momentum, although it's a very strange period. We've, you know, people have talked about this. I won't, I won't repeat everything. You all know it. We do have the, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights this year. So maybe there is a, a good window here to uh, reaffirm the universality of principles uh, and rights as part of our uh, action. At the same time, I think we need to um, engage on the new challenges that we face, the geopolitical challenges, some of them uh, are, are, are manifest, but also the other ones to the extent that they're separable, climate change, digitalization, um, all of these increasingly young populations in the world, uh, etc. So all of these call for new answers to uh, possibly questions that have been around for a long time and also for learning lessons from the past, I would say. Um, so that's the answer to the question, how will the EU promote democracy? It's been doing so and we need to also look forward to how we can do it better. Maybe to engage a little bit on the recommendations, a couple of remarks. The first one, the EU should build a new narrative on democracy uh, while at the same time being humble and transparent. That's squaring the circle, in, in my view. It throws up all the dilemmas that you face uh, in this particular uh, context. I think you may, I mean, on the ambition we've heard uh, colleagues speak about that, let me focus for a moment on the humility. I think that's really important. Uh, it, mean, and it says so in the recommendations. It means listening to partners. It means dialogue. It means openness. And it also means accepting diversity. There's no one you know, there's not a single solution for everything and no one has per se the best idea for everything. Um, the issue of conditionality certainly is one that's a tricky one. From personal experience, I worked, um, I've been in development cooperation for, and international partnerships for a very long time. Uh, I worked in a number of countries that posed particular challenges in that regard. I was posted in China at the start of my career where I was the, uh, in charge of uh, the sector dealing with governance, democracy, civil society, so all these issues that we are talking about here today. At that point, this is in the early 90s, we saw a window of opportunity. That window has uh, long gone, uh, so things, things change uh, and, and dynamics change. I was head of cooperation for the uh, EU in Afghanistan, um, you know, where um, we did apply conditionality, and I, can, I have very vivid memories of that. I remember sitting down with the Vice President of Afghanistan and the UN Under Secretary General, with the UN Under Secretary General saying to the Vice President, but, but VP, there must be something you can deliver on these conditions. It, it, you know, it throws up these dilemmas about being principled and pragmatic uh, at the same time. I was also based in Yemen where we supported a failed democratic experiment. So there are, you know, there are lessons to be, what I'm trying to say is that there are lessons to be learned from these experiences and I think we need to go sometimes further in uh, learning those lessons and why uh, the very good intentions that we had didn't always uh, materialize. On the second uh, recommendation, using democracy as a guide in all external policies and policy coherence, certainly I think we strive for that. Global Gateway, I think, is a step forward in that sense. It really is very much a values-based uh, approach uh, and it tries to bring together, um, you know, investment and promoting values and making sure that those values are actually uh, part of the dynamic in, in uh, how uh, we work. Of course, we have the toolbox, we have the human rights-based approach that was adopted in 2021. Could it be refined? Most likely, yes. Uh, we have conflict assessment uh, analysis tools, we have monitoring results frameworks. So we have a whole range of tools that we can use, not all of them uh, possibly very sexy, but actually quite useful to make sure that we take into account the various uh, dimensions of how to ensure uh, coherence um, in, in our work. Um, on the recommendation to adopt an EU integrated approach to democracy support in, in external relations, this focuses quite a lot on uh, more guidelines. Um, sure, but um, let's, let's look uh, at what we have first and see if we can fine tune that rather than you know, producing the next 500-page uh, manual that people will then uh, struggle with. Uh, um, I, I would like to flag here that in the context of the Team Europe Democracy 
uh, uh, initiative. We do support quite a lot of research, including with uh, International IDEA. I think that is very valuable, and uh, we really um, need to look there as well for the creation of new uh, narratives. Um, so that's, that's another um, uh, strand uh, of work. Uh, then on gender and youth, it's been mentioned before, I'd just like to recall that we've been investing quite heavily in these fields uh, for the last few years and in inclusive approaches. It started mainly with a focus on women, the gender action plans, we're now in the third generation and with every iteration of the gender action plan we see that things uh, improve. If, you know, I don't want to be too inward looking or dwell too much on statistics, but if we look at how our own actions are now gender um, gender sensitive or gender informed or put gender at the center of uh, what we do, the, 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 you know, the percentages are actually phenomenal. They're really high and they exceed what we expected to achieve. So that's, that's good. It's not the solution for everything, but certainly good. We now have the Youth Action Plan uh, and, uh, that, uh, and, and the involvement of youth in the Summit for Democracy. So uh, that's a major strand now as well. And we were, we're uh, launching a new Women and Youth in Democracy uh, uh, initiative uh, of 40 million euro that will add another layer of uh, dynamics uh, in that uh, regard. So um, I'll stop there uh, also to leave some time for uh, discussion with, uh, with uh, people in the room. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. Now, Misha, Misha uh, the uh, million-dollar question, and a lot of speakers already raised it, you know, we have to show that democracy delivers. Uh, and uh, your DGE you know, spends billions and billions on socioeconomic uh, progress, on making sure that people get housing and schools. And so how do we make sure that the link between the, the work you do on democracy and all that other stuff, you know, all the socioeconomic stuff, that that is clear so that we can actually demonstrate that democracy delivers. Do you have the, the magic bullet for that? I was going to say we don't do million dollar questions, we only do billion dollar questions, but, uh, but, but yes. Uh, I mean, um, without going to a lengthy explanation, I think you, you could look at, at what we try to do with Global Gateway right now to see how we try and pull all of that together. Global Gateway, people tend to think it's about you know, digital or infrastructure or roads or, 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 or you know, transport corridors and stuff like that. It's not just about hardware. It includes the social dimension. It includes health. It includes education. It includes empowerment of uh, disenfranchised groups and it links it up with democratic values. Uh, there are other ways of doing that. More, more historical examples would include, I would say, how we deal with budget support, if, you know, without going into a, a very long, detailed technical explanation of how that works. There is no budget support without adherence to uh, basic values, including human rights, including democratic values, governance values, transparency, uh, and, and those uh, issues really are, are there. So I don't think, I mean, I'm in a thematic unit, but we, you know, we work with the whole DG. We don't separate out the two. It's not some kind of niche reservation uh, that we're in. Okay. Integrated approach, uh, going back to the terminology of the report. Thank you very much, Misha. Uh, now on to the last speaker, Dr. Janjira Sombat Punziri uh, of the Institute of Asian Stud Studies at Chula Longkorn University and uh, of the German Institute for Global and Area Studies. He has a double hat. Janjira uh, is an assistant professor. She has a PhD in politics and international relations, and her area of focus is the whole range of civic activism social movements, digital activism, and I've, uh, I, I've seen that in practice. She is really one of the global experts on the digital uh, and civic rights issue. Uh, and she has importantly participated in many of our dialogues that put this report together. So without any further ado, uh, Janjira, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, do you all hear me well? Good, okay, thank you. Um, greetings from Bangkok. Um, uh, it's a pity that I could not be there to participate in this very high level and um, stimulating um, panel today. So um, I, I, I would like to first of all uh, express my uh, my thanks to the IDEA team who organized this uh, very important uh, event and also uh, for inviting me here. Um, I, I, 
I think that I, I should start by commending uh, the great efforts uh, the team made uh, putting together this really important report. And I think it covers a wide range of issues crucial for strengthening democracy in the age of autocratization and great power competition. And so um, just to uh, keep my um, speech short and so we can leave some time for the audience and for q and a, um, I'd like to um, highlight two points. Um, one is humility in relation to um, narrative. Um, a lot of uh, speakers uh, in this panel and in the in, in the previous panel have already touched upon. Um, and the second point is um, cohesion in relation to geopolitical uh, side role. So um, number one, I think uh, the report, um, the most important um, uh, contribution of the report is to basically suggest that uh, democracy should reinvent its narrative um, in, in the new world. And, and I think that is important because when we talk about the defense of democracy, we basically uh, talk about how we can um, support democratic legitimacy. And what I mean by that is um, uh, a lot of speakers have mentioned um, democratic values and institutions, how we can sustain these in the changing world. And I think one of the most effective way to do this is to uh, basically consolidate um, the legitimate basis um, that would allow citizens themselves to uphold democratic values and institutions. So in other words, in order for us to defend democracy, its values and institutions have to be seen by the constituents as legitimate. And I think one of the ways to do this in the age of um, democratic erosion and basically autocratic contestation is to show, and I think a lot of speakers have already highlighted this point, is to show that democracies can improve um, people's livelihoods. And now I'm sitting in, in Thailand, in Bangkok. I used to uh, commute between Berlin and Bangkok. Um, and I think uh, it is eye-opening to, to come home and to see uh, uh, economic development uh, um, in, in, in this region because people are struggling to uh, make ends meet. And, and I think uh, what is happening in the world for them is only um, in their interest when it impacts their um, everyday economic lives. And uh, uh, it's also interesting to be here during the election campaigns um, because Thailand is uh, uh, you know, having an election possibly in May. Um, the, the discourse uh, or the rhetoric about um, strength, strengthening democratic legitimacy in Thailand is not so much about the values and the principles, but in fact, it's about how democracy can be related to a uh, welfare state, to um, basically a better social safety net uh, for citizens. And in that sense, I think Sweden uh, uh, comes up as, as a good example uh, when, when I talk to uh, ordinary ties about how they perceive Europe um, and democracy in the region. Usually they say, well, they have a good social system and they have a really uh, strong social safety net for um, their uh, citizens. And I think this is one of the strengths of uh, democracy in Europe that we sometimes uh, tend to uh, forget about it or uh, not highlight that characteristic uh, enough. And I think this is what we, um, when we talk about uh, reinventing uh, democracy, um, this is what it means. Um, the fact that over the past years, um, there's increasing uh, incongruence between democracy and economic well-being of citizens. Um, it also says a lot about how democracy has failed, um, in, in some cases, has failed its citizens, um, uh, economically speaking. And I think um, what we can say about democracy is that when it makes mistakes, when its policies have not been successful, democracies can reinvent itself, democracies can be self-corrected, and democracies can 
improve itself based on these mistakes actually better than autocracies. Uh, look at China uh, after its uh, zero COVID policies that actually damage uh, its own economy. There is even no apology from the government. There is uh, 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 no statement uh, to basically admit that the policy is problematic. And I think that in Europe and, and the West in general, um, this is not necessarily the case. And I think this is one of the narratives that we have to highlight more, that democracy can redeem itself. And so the second point, and I will be uh, very, very quick, um, I think uh, we have talked a lot about uh, how democracy uh, fares in uh, this new uh, geopolitical world, right? Or or the the renewal of the geo geopolitical competition. I think that uh, uh, in Asia, quite interestingly, when uh, uh, Russia uh, invaded uh, Ukraine, um, I think uh, a lot of Southeast Asian nations. Um, uh, were quite shocked, but as shocked as when the U.S. invaded Iraq. Um, and I think um, that speaks to um, uh, policies, international policies of uh, uh, democracies in the West over the past uh, 10 years, that um, it has not been very coherent. At some point, democracies uh, go to war, at other points, democracy uh, want to defend countries from being invaded. Um, and I, I think that uh, uh, in order, uh, this is to connect with my previous point, in order for uh, Europe and for democracies to uh, redeem their reputation, their image in a changing world, um, uh, policy coherence um, in international conflict is very important. And I think all eyes are watching Europe right now, uh, how the region is going to deal with uh, armed conflict in, 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 in its neighbor. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people here are praying that there will not be uh, an escalation of the war because that would mean uh, the future of uh, the conflict between uh, China and Taiwan is also uh, not looking very bright. And I think I want to end uh, my, my first round um, contribution here. I think that um, the fact that uh, we have this report, the fact that we discuss here today, that already speaks a lot about how democracy can actually survive and thrive in a new changing world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janjira. Instead of me asking you a question, I'm going to throw it open and see if there's any questions from the audience for Janjira. Don't be shy. Or from the, from the panelists. OK, uh, think about a question for Janjira. I'm going to ask if there's any questions for the panelists. Otherwise, I'm going to keep the discussion going. But I want to see if there's any questions. For oh, there we go. There we go. Let's get, go here at the front row. Uh, if you could say your name, please, and then ask your question. Uh, and to whom, please? Thank you, uh, Peter Burian. I'm ambassador at large for human rights from Slovakia. And before in this position, I was dealing with one of the uh, most challenging regions of Central Asia, uh, where, of course, uh, the democracy and human rights and also uh, civil society uh, are under pressure, I have to say. But starting um, uh, my kind of brief intervention and questions, I would like to congratulate IDEA for an excellent uh, report, and uh, I believe it should be considered and reflected in uh, the preparation of the next uh, action plan. And also, I wanted to thank uh, Sweden for bringing this agenda and putting it high uh, on the agenda of the presidency. Here, uh, we are discussing external action, of course, uh, primarily. But uh, I fully agree that uh, we need to 
start from home uh, to be a credible actor and player. And I fully agree with uh, Thomas, who mentioned that many times when we are discussing democracy and uh, human rights, uh, even our leaders uh, are not convinced that this should be uh, the main priority. And that's why we need to start the messaging uh, and discussions with our uh, leaders, our political representations in both European Parliament, but uh, in particular at home in parliaments, but also we need to talk to private sector and um, convince private sector that it's actually worth thinking uh, uh, how a private sector uh, can uh, support democracy in countries where uh, our companies are investing and so on. Uh, this is something I um, thought that uh, private sector should be also better represented in team uh, democracy, uh, uh, team Europe democracy. And I'm uh, asking just the question, how you see the role of private uh, sector in this regard? In particular, not only promoting uh, democracy and uh, fighting corruption and so on, but also sharing technologies and maybe stepping ahead of uh, uh, the use of uh, innovative solutions and technologies uh, through private sector uh, activities and so on. Because here I see that uh, the enemies of democracy are much faster in using even uh, advanced technologies. My question would be uh, to all the panelists, but in particular to Misha, how you see the first year of uh, the work and activities of team, uh, de uh, team Europe democracy, um, whether there are some really positive things, but in particular where you see a greater space for improvement. Uh, I, I've heard from Eman that in particular more space should be given uh, to civil society, not only in shaping policies, but also in implementing um, what we agreed. Uh, my second question would be, and I'm sorry for asking too many questions, would be to Belen. Um, I, I, I fully agree that uh, it's very important that the EU is engaged in the process started by Summit for Democracy. And I see many good activities, but coming from the focal group meeting uh, in Washington, I still see that there are too many questions not answered about the future of Summit for Democracy beyond the second summit in Washington. And I believe uh, EU should be coming with good ideas, but I also wanted to once again comment idea coming with good ideas about the follow-up process. We do not need too many summits, but we need a very concrete implementation of our commitment. So I will stop here and uh, once again, thank you for a great event and discussion. And um, I look forward to a follow-up of this. Ambassador, uh, actually counted three questions. I'm going to repeat them quickly. First, uh, I guess to Thomas, how do we deal with our own leaders? How do we make sure that our own leaders also see democracy as a priority? Your prime minister, I don't think, needs convincing because he mentioned democracy. I counted, I think it was eight times uh, in the European Parliament two weeks ago. But still, uh, how do we deal with our own leaders? Second question is private sector. Uh, Misha, I think this question was for you. Uh, private sector's role in Team Europe democracy. And thirdly, uh, what's the future of the Summit for Democracy, Belen? So, uh, Thomas, you want to start? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador, for raising that question. And I, I fully share your, your view that, of course, uh, we have to do our part uh, ourselves in the Union uh, as well. And, of course, we are in a very unfortunate uh, situation in, in many countries, uh, to be honest. Uh, I mean, we have the most obvious one that I would like to mention, and of course, um, it's always sensitive uh, to name drop, uh, but of course, we have huge problems in Hungary and in Poland. And uh, from, the parliament, uh, from the parliament's positions, of course, our view is that if we, if we let uh, basically democracy decline, even in our own member states, if we let rule of law decline, and we let this pass, but then we have opened the door for everyone to do it. And I think this is really what's at stake now. And I understand that we have different uh, um, positions on, on how to act. But from the European Parliament 
point of view, I don't think there is uh, a lot of uh, maneuver uh, to negotiate, to be honest. I mean, I understand that we need, um, of course, now in the, in the discussion that we're having, of course, uh, if we can see some progress, of course, then we can again uh, discussion. Uh, then we can again uh, discuss. Of course, um, that they can be part of the recovery plans. Uh, I think also the Article uh, Seven is something that we we shouldn't shy away from. That's one part of it. I think we need to be very very strong on this because I think we will um, we we for sure know that uh, otherwise. Uh, I mean, I, I can't see an, another way to go. And also, I must say that it's becoming very clear that Viktor Orban is getting more and more alone uh, as well. And that is, is very helpful. Secondly, uh, I think it is uh, important that more, uh, and that comes to the leadership. And I do, I must say that, of course, I see it from the Swedish presidency. I must also say that I'm quite hopeful uh, that we will see it uh, from Ursula von der Leyen as, as well, that we have to understand that democracy, rule of law, that is the foundation. And I think that is really what it comes down to, that uh, can we see that uh, leadership more clearly, um, then we might be able to deliver. And also we need to understand that uh, within the council, they will also have to take their responsibility. We are talking now that we want to build a partnership uh, with Africa, we are trying to get the signature for the post Cotonou agreement. We're still not there. And it's frankly, it's embarrassing uh, for Europe. We are talking that we want a new partnership. We want to, to build a stronger civil society. We want to empower youth. We want to empower women. And we cannot deliver because we have one country uh, blocking this in the council. And that is not acceptable anymore. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Then on to Belen. Yes, I agree that that is not acceptable. It's possibly the price to pay for the democratic processes of, <laughs> of our institutions, uh, as, as frustrating as it feels. Huh? Uh, on the future of the Summit for Democracy, I think it would be very arrogant from me to put an opinion on what the US intends to do. You've been there. I learned it through the very good report to my Staff, but I understand that they have no intention at this stage to organize a third summit for democracy. Uh, what I can say is that it would be, um, it is not currently foreseen that, that we organize on the EU a summit for democracy. And I wouldn't want to have our leaders deciding whose countries are invited as democracies, which ones are not, which was part of the trouble the US had to go through. And in times when we are told to be um, humble and engage, it's not something I would recommend. But I do think that we need to continue working. That shouldn't prevent us from working. And our priority, in, besides the old engagement that we have with civil societies and others, is in particular when the regular one, when we will be discussing the next action plan to have a lot of good engagement with civil societies and different actors to make sure that it comes out with the full backing of the different stake, stakeholders in a very democratic way, including our member states, hopefully. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, Belen. Let's go on to Misha on to Team Europe Democracy, and if there's anything else you want to say about the summit, which you've supported, uh, go ahead as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the very good uh, pointed uh, question. Um, there were actually two questions, I think. One, how, was the, how would you evaluate the first year of the Team Europe uh, Democracy Initiative and then the involvement of the private sector specifically? So, on the first uh, aspect, I would say very positive. First of all, there wasn't one uh, a year ago. There is now a, a lively um, initiative that involves uh, 14 member states. I'm, I'm not sure everyone in the room knows what the Team Europe initiative is, but it's basically a, a platform for cooperation between the European institutions and the member states. So it's, it's joining up forces and resources to have a bigger uh, impact on a specific issue. We have them on a, a range of issues, and one of them is specifically on uh, uh, you know, furthering uh, democracy. So that's, that's the Team Europe uh, initiative on democracy. As I said, it involves 14 EU member states. Uh, and European institutions around a number of central thematic priorities, the rule of law and anti-corruption, but also civic and political participation, media 
uh, and digital. And we try to bring uh, together a variety, various communities of stakeholders to promote cooperation at an operational level. So it's not only uh, um, you know, a theoretical discussion to increase the, the effectiveness of our democracy systems. For the CSO community specifically, and, and there may be um, people involved in, in, in uh, civil society organizations in the room, we will be launching a, a call for uh, uh, interest, expression of interest, to participate in the TED CSO network on the 15th of February, so in two weeks from now. Uh, and uh, there's, there are people here from the TED Secretariat as well, so uh, you, you can get in touch uh, with each other. Uh, that's uh, certainly one way uh, for civil society organizations to get involved. Uh, I mentioned also that it includes a research component, so there's, there's quite a lot of investment there. We work with International IDEA, with EPD, with Car Carnegie International, RSF, varieties of democracy and, 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 and those organizations. On the private sector specifically, uh, we, we do want to engage, although it's not an obvious uh, issue for engaging with the private sector, notably on the digital uh, aspects where there is obviously a link and a tension between democracy and, and evolutions uh, at this point in time. Uh, we're looking into that. It's not fully formulated, but we are, for example, discussing uh, with EU member states, uh, Denmark's Tech, Tech for Democracy initiative, and to see how we can link all of that up uh, in the context of the Team Europe uh, Democracy um, uh, Team Europe Initiative. So it's certainly not an issue that's forgotten. It's it's work in progress, but it's uh, it's definitely uh, on our on our screen. Thank you, Misha. Um, I'm looking at the other two speakers. Anything to add on these questions before we go back for a second round of questions, Mathieu? Maybe, maybe more a general uh, question about the private sector. I mean, their involvement is absolutely key. I think the, the type of governance which also works in the private sector is something which, which is about democracy. So uh, working with private sector, and I think a key word which is important for me is really accountability. So um, accountability in the democratic institutions, but also accountability of the private sector. So I think there can be some partnerships in addition to the digital innovation that uh, the, the, the private sector can, uh, can bring in. I think even, I mean, working with, uh, with big companies or with small companies, I mean, the way we are supporting them, the way we can work with them, I mean, to promote internal uh, good, good governance uh, and to get the lessons from them also in terms of governance and accountability, I think is a lesson uh, very useful for us as well. So, so very happy and we are working with the private sector on that. Uh, I think, Misha, you had an afterthought. Uh, I had an afterthought. Yeah, you actually asked another question, so with, to which I didn't answer, which was about the Summit for Democracy. Very briefly, uh, we, we've actively supported the Summit for Democracy, and we continue uh, to do so. Um, you know, in, in, in the past, we focused very much on making sure that the process was uh, inclusive, that it in included uh, good civil society uh, uh, consultation and participation in the summit. Uh, we also support very actively the, the voice of youth, uh, we're involved in the so-called youth participation cohort, um, uh, especially working with youth uh, from the south, and we've, we've partnered up with Ghana, with Nepal, and with uh, uh, CSOs from uh, Africa and Europe in that regard, and we will also be taking that forward in the context of the, of the forthcoming uh, edition of the Summit for Democracy. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go for one more round of questions because we have to round up at 12.30 and this is going to be difficult because I see a lot of hands. Let's hear uh, from all four of you, but really quickly, and then I'm going to ask panelists to pick and choose until time is out. So we start at the left. Go ahead. And keep it really succinct, please. Yes, yeah, sure. Hi, my name's Sandra Kaduri from Keeping Channels Open. I just wanted to know, sorry, it's an internal democracy question, what you're doing to shake people out of complacency. I'm from UK, let down by a democracy, let down perhaps by the EU as well. If you ask anyone what democracy is, it means different things. So can we see a back to basics campaign to get people to really care about what it is and, and their responsibilities to each other, the limits of freedom versus, you know, individual versus is responsibility because I, I'm really worried what else might happen as people try to polarize us and separate us and work against the climate agenda and I'm let down by democracy so you know many of us have been uh, yeah in the middle go ahead 
Thank you very quickly. Uh, Cla Claudia Francavilla from Numerous Watch. Uh, it was very important to hear from the guest from the screen, I'm sorry, I don't want to butcher the surname, uh, that the, the narrative around um, democracy is not only built by words, but also by deeds, by action, and so the importance of the policy co co coherence. And uh, uh, we have, we have uh, time and again raised out the da Hubble standards in the foreign policy can then undermine, if you will, even the credi credibility. Okay, uh, can can undermine the the credibility. Sorry. So it's important to have that uh, re reflection, and it's important to stress how the being humble recommendation the report does not mean being tolerant. The the report is very clear about being uh, strong, uh, having some red lines conditionality, more for more, etc. And I come to the question, what can we learn from the accession pr procedure in the EU, which is, if you will, the DNA of the EU, how it came about, which had all the benchmarks in order to get to some point. And the benchmarks are quite public, quite clear. How can we learn from that experience and maybe try to apply to trade deal to the GSP plus to have some public clear benchmarks for accountability for the governments linked to human rights and democracy. Uh, unfortunately, we have to end it there with questions. Apologies to the two other hands that were up, but uh, time is really ticking. I'm just going to push it back to the, the panel and see if all the speakers want to take another 30 seconds to respond. Uh, and let's do it in reverse order, starting with Janjira on screen. Janjira. Okay, um, uh, thanks a lot for these uh, really great questions. Um, I, I think because uh, for the benefit of time, um, I think to, to, to conclude this panel, um, I think there's a lot of hope um, in democracy still. And I think in the digital age, um, there are a lot of things we can do. Um, I think just to respond to um, the gentleman's question about the role of private sector earlier, um, I think we have to think more about how automation can help us uh, improve uh, democratic governance, um, uh, be it uh, in relation to corruption policies, be it in relation to job creations, uh, uh, giving opportunities to uh, the marginalized communities, right? So um, the use of AI automation are not always um, to undermine uh, human's future, but also to hit, enhance it. And I think uh, the private sector in Europe uh, has been um, at the forefront of this. And I think it's crucial for the EU to engage with uh, regional private sector. And I think last but not least, um, absolutely uh, policy coherence is key. And I think that's why I have highlighted that um, the uh, one of the few ways uh, in which um, democracies can do better than autocracies it is to be self-reflective and to be accountable for its own uh, uh, flaws sometimes. And I think that uh, sense of uh, inflection is, is key to democracy. Thank you, Janjira. Uh, Misha. Uh, which question am I trying to answer at this stage? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, uh, just uh, maybe to say that uh, what I think what is is very clear from the discussion is that um, you know finding a way forward in a very complex and increasingly uh, fractured uh, world uh, requires uh, <clears throat> you know a, a process of iterative, iterative thinking and experimentation I think and I think you know with what we've got um, speaking from my own uh, organization on the table with Global Gateway with the Team Europe initiatives. Uh, 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 and, and other innovative ways of working that we are we're really trying to see how we can in fact uh, renew uh, the narrative and not only the narrative but also the ways of doing and increasing uh, the coherence are we there is it perfect probably not uh, but definitely uh, there's you know a renewed uh, sense of urgency uh, and, and a willingness to invest in these issues thank you Mathieu go ahead Thank you. Maybe two points also to respond to the questions. I mean, of course, I mean, with the accession pro process, we have a specific number of benchmarks. But I think the idea is also, and, and uh, Thomas Tobé was talking about uh, conditionality. I mean, it's to, to discuss with partner countries and to jointly agree 
uh, together about uh, a way forward, I mean, to consolidate a number of elements related to democracy or related to something else. And you can see the value added of getting some clear indicators on benchmarks, I mean, which, uh, which is very much, I mean, a, an agreed process. And, and this is a more value. I mean, in terms of humility, this is not EU dictating, I mean, what are the benchmarks, but it's very much, I mean, through the policy discussion with the partner countries, I mean, agreeing on some steps that can be made in one, one direction. And maybe to respond to, to the first comment on the, the, the democracy, I mean, really to have, um, to have it in practice. Uh, just to give you an example, I mean, I went to, to Georgia some, uh, some uh, uh, two years ago, and we discussed with a local action group in Georgia, uh, so really community-based uh, processes. And basically what we propose there is to support their development using the leader approach that we use in Europe. So basically that the committee should organize itself, facilitated by civil society organization, and define objectives for them to move forward. And the reaction was was quite interesting from them. They said, of course, I mean, we are in a country where we have Europe on one side and Russia on the other side. And they say what everybody, I mean, the, let's say the Russian influence people were saying, you have an independent agenda. I mean, what is it you are going to be uh, taken? And, and the people working through this process of creating a lo local action group, I mean, to move on defined targets which are self defined uh, targets, they just say, I mean, we were surprised to see that Europe had no agenda except to foster democracy in the country. So that was fascinating, I mean, to get that from the people in our neighboring countries. With our support, we can make a difference. I hope this responds to your question. Thank you, Mathieu. Belen. No, just very, very briefly, I mean, to the broader question of what else can we do, and democracy has let me down. <laughs> Uh, I see two, two uh, tracks that are really a priority for us. First, working with youth, because they will be the voters and the ones that will need to work <laughs> and defend the democracy when uh, we might be too old to do it. And uh, secondly, everything that has to do with uh, disinformation and the narrative, because that's the easier, easiest way to manipulate. And i give you a quick example. Last week, there was some poll made in Belgium that came out that said half of the Belgian population prefer an authoritarian regime. I'm not sure what was the question, how was that presented, but I'm very convinced that people that responded that prefer an authoritarian regime weren't well informed about the, the consequences of what they were saying. So just to show that even here we have a problem. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, finally, Thomas. Well, I, I think what is also within those questions that is raised is basically what are we? I mean, what are Europe? And, and for me, of course, we are a continent where a lot of member states, we have come together because we want peace at our, comp comp uh, our continent. Yes, we have some shared interests, some challenges, some opportunities. But the basic question is, do we have some common values or not? And for me, it's very clear that yes, we do. And that means that uh, if that if you are of the opinion that in Europe we do believe in human rights, the protection of minorities, rule of law, on democracy, well then we have to fight for it. We will have to fight for it within our union, and we have to fight for it in the world. And and the only way to do that uh, is of course to win the hearts of people. That's what we try to do in democracy. People have the right to make their own choice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas, I think we've had a, a, a great discussion. Indeed, the EU has done a lot since 30 years back, as Misha said. But I think from all the interventions we also learned, there's a lot more to do. Uh, and importantly, there's a lot of willingness to do more, with humility, with cohesion. But with those two principles, there's a lot more to put in that toolbox that the, that the EU already has. So with that, I'd like to finish it, and I'll hand back to Marilyn for the practical details. Thank you to Thomas Tobé, Belen Martinez Carbonel, Mathieu Busquet, Misha Ramakers, and Janjira Sombat Punsiri. A warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again.
Thank you again, Sam and speaker. It was an excellent panel. Uh, we're very happy with that. Uh, you summarized the intervention already uh, wisely into takeaway, Sam, and we keep some good follow-ups uh, for the team from that. It is great to see how little seeds are being planted and picked up by people who are really shaping EU's democracy uh, policy. So the extra good news I can share is that uh, there's a lunch break coming up. Uh, sandwiches are served uh, in the page show where you were for the coffee break. So uh, let's convene back in this room at uh, 25 past one so we can start in time with the afternoon schedule. Thank you. <laughs>